Hey gang, Pastor Kent here. I'm excited to be with you today via video. I would be more excited to be with you in person, but the last time I tried that, I puked. So I'm really glad to be with you today. And we're going to be able to get back to Revelation chapter 20 because we just got started in that. We're never able to finish the sermon. And I want to make sure we're set up to go to heaven when I get back. I mean, in the Bible, go to heaven, which is chapters 21, 20 and 20, uh, excuse me, 21 and 22. And so I just want to set us up to, re to review where we are in the book of Revelation, give us an introduction, and then get into the details of our, our passage today. As I've said many times before, I'm going to say it again. This is Bible study style. We're just going to go through it verse by verse and touch on things that I find interesting and fascinating and hopefully helpful to you in your understanding of God's Word. And so we said as we begin, what is the theme of the book? The theme of the book is the, the revelation or the unveiling or the disclo full disclosure disclosure of Jesus Christ. He came as a suffering servant the first time. Now we're going to find out in the book of Revelation, he comes back as a triumphant warrior king. And that's the great thing about our Savior. We get a complete picture of him. And so in verse 1, we're told it's the revelation of Jesus Christ, which includes both his nature, person, and uh, plan for eternity. Also, it's about the end of days and the final judgment as well, and heaven and hell as it turns out at the end. And so this is a great book to study. I'm excited about it. And the Bible even says, the book itself says in verse 3, that we get a special blessing if we are going to study this together. We get a special blessing beyond the other blessing we normally get when we study God's Word. So this is like a double dip blessing. That's why another reason I'm excited about it. The third thing that we do see in chapter 1 is not just the revelation of Jesus, which is the theme, and secondly, the blessing that's upon us, but third is the outline of the book found in verse 19. And I want to read to you what it says in verse 19 because the angel is telling John exactly what God wants to reveal to him in advance. It's kind of like the introduction to John and what he's going to be doing. And this is what he says in verse 19. He says, therefore, he's talking to John, write the things which you have seen. And the things you have seen is this encounter with the angel right there on the island of Patmos. And the things which are, the stuff that's happening in the world during that time period and up until the future time period known as the end of days. And that's when he says the third phrase, and the things which will take place after these things. So the things that you've seen, stuff that took place in chapter 1. The things which are the stuff that takes place in the world or the church age in chapters 2 and 3. And we get in those chapters seven different archetypes of churches. And those churches are also archetypes of spiritual maturity because a church is just a collection of believers. And therefore, we understand the growth and development and progress and problems that churches have are addressed there. And Jesus is the great physician giving a prescription at the end of each one of his discussions of these churches as to what to do if you're at that particular spiritual state in your church or in your personal life. So it's a great diagnostic two chapters about spiritual growth and development, a wonderful, wonderful passage. Then in chapters 4 and 5, we have what is known as the heavenly throne room scene. Scholars call it a divine council meeting, and this is a picture of what's going on in heaven. And so from chapter 4 to the end of the, the entire book is a series of uh, revelations or unveilings of the stuff that God wants John to see, but it really comes from heaven. And so in this heavenly throne room scene, we're given the general outline of what God's going to tell him before he gives him all the details. And the general outline is that there is only one in all of the universe of living beings that is worthy to open a scroll that has seven seals on it. And these seven seals are, are a record of the end of days. In other words, how the rest of human history is going to unfold. And the worthy one is the Lamb of God who took away the sins of the world, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who is the theme of that, that scroll, the theme of the book of Revelation. And in those seven seals, you have an unfolding of a number of judgments of God that prepares for the day of the Lord, which is the end of, the end of days, and eternity. And so the first six, excuse me, the first seven seals contain these seven different judgments. But when you get to the end of those seven seals, you, get to, you open the seventh seal, which would be the last chapter of the book if it was a book, right? There's only seven sections. You would open that and, uh-oh, there's more stuff. 
And what is it? It's seven trumpets. And these trumpets are further explanations of what he just discussed in the previous chapters or the previous seals. And there's seven of these trumpet judgments. And when you get to the seventh one, you look and it, uh uh-oh, there are seven more disclosures known as vile or bowl judgments. And these seven bowl judgments are revealed to us in, uh, and end with the, with the conflict of Armageddon. And so what you see is it's like a Russian nesting doll. You have these series of different judgments that are all contained in these chapters, and after you get to the end of one series of judgments, it pops up seven more judgments, and then seven more when you get to the end of that one. And so what you really see is the seventh seal contains the seventh trumpet that contains the seventh vial, which contains everything up until the second coming of Jesus Christ. And so that's what this is about. And then we back it up a little bit. In chapters 15 and 16, the uh, different vile judgments are mentioned because they're really a summary of all that's taken place, or bowl judgments, I can call it that as well. They're, they're going to, it's like, like God tells John, now, John, I, I give me the big picture. I want you to back it up now here in chapter 15 and explain to them how these seven bowl judgments, which happen rapidly at the very end of the very end of the very end before Jesus comes back. And so that's what he does. And chapter 15 are the arrangements that take place in heaven. And chapter 16 are the judgments that take place on earth in which God is going to pour out his judgment. And the purpose of the judgment is to get people to repent so that they could receive God's forgiveness and the gift of eternal life. Instead of going into eternal damnation, we're very, very close to the very, very, very end of the time clock. And God has taken another shot to try to get them to repent because he loves us. He loves everyone. Even the death of a sinner brings no joy to God. He wants them to repent. And so this is the purpose of those intensified judgments known as the bowl judgments, which is really a summary of all the ones we've seen so far. And the seventh bowl judgment ends on earth with the battle of Armageddon. The seventh bowl is essentially the battle of Armageddon. And so then we get a pause at chapter 16, and it's like God tells John, okay, Now we've clarified how this is going to come back, how there's this great battle that's going to bring Jesus back. But before we get to the details of that, I want to go back and talk about another important issue, and that is the issue of Babylon. I mentioned it in chapter 14 to you, John, but I'm now going to give you two chapters of profound detail about Babylon and what it's all about. And Babylon is both a place and a system. It is the organized, systematic spiritual and physical opposition to God throughout all of human history, beginning immediately after the flood at a place called the Tower of Babel, from which we get Babel. And it is the kingdom of darkness opposed to the kingdom of God on earth being uh, driven by dark forces of evil and by the prince of darkness himself. And so Babylon is actually the antitype of the kingdom of God. And it is in constant chaos, constant conflict with what God's trying to establish on the earth. It is the arch kingdom uh, 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 enemy of God. And so he said, I'm going to give you two chapters on how I'm going to deal with this ancient spiritual evil that has been on the earth that manifests both as a physical place as well as a spiritual system of wickedness and evil insinuated into human civilization through multiple different uh, risings and fallings of civilization, civilizations throughout human history. It's Babylon. In chapter 17, he addresses the spiritual dimension of Babylon, which becomes the center of the false ecumenical worldwide religious system replacing, okay, replacing the worship of the true God. And in the middle of this seven-year period we know is the tribulation or the end of days, the Antichrist, who has been driving Babylon all along, who is really Satan himself, right, he arises and says, you know, let's just quit worrying about this other stuff. Let's quit faking it. Let's, let, let's just get to the bottom line. You're going to worship me. So he wipes out all the religions on the face of the earth halfway through this seven-year period. He goes up to the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, and he says, worship me. And that's what is taking place. He is the, the, the archetype of Babylon, Babylon's spiritual evil and how God was going to deal with him. 
That's chapter 17. Chapter 18 is the defeat of commercial Babylon. So that's what happens in the spiritual realm. There's also the commercial and economic and political and social dimension. And he talks about that in chapter 18. That's the center of the world's political and economic systems headed up by Antichrist, which is finally destroyed, finally destroyed at the Battle of Armageddon, Har Moed, the Mount of Assembly, the Mount Zion in Jerusalem. Why? Because when Jesus comes back, he's going to fulfill his messianic promises to the Jews, which says that there will be an eternal king who sits on the throne of David, and that king would be uh, the Lord the Lord of David. And he quote, and there's a passage that says that David says, the Lord said to my Lord, which tells you there's two parts to Yahweh in the Old Testament as well as the New. And that Lord who said to my Lord is the Father speaking to the Son to fulfill his promise, to put him on the throne of David and keep his promise to David as well. So, in chapter 19 then, so that, that he says, okay, there's our little recap of what happened in Babylon. Now let's get to chapter 19 because I want to talk more detail about this battle of Armageddon, which is the very end of the seals, the seven, the, of the seven seals, the very end of the seven trumpets, the very end of the seven bowl judgments. And the return of Jesus Christ in the battle of Armageddon is the theme of chapter 19. And it's a celebration of God's victory over evil, both spiritual and human, think Babylon, and a recapitulation of this battle of Armageddon with special focus on the determining factor of the battle, which is the return of Jesus Christ, the promised Messiah. Then last time, in chapter 20, verses 1 to 10, we have what is called the millennium. Because at the end of the battle of Armageddon, the Antichrist and the false prophet are cast into the lake of fire, and they are never to be released again. That's eternal damnation. And now God has fulfilled the end of days, and now he's going to go into the kingdom phase or the fulfillment of the promises to the Messiah phase, also known as the millennium or the thousand-year reign of Christ upon the earth. And as soon as we mention that, chapter 20 is a pivotal passage that scholars debate throughout history, and they do so. In the, when I say scholars, I'm talking about Christian, wonderful men and women who love the Lord, love his word and everything, and have just an honest disagreement of how to handle it. And they say, okay, we have this, this kingdom ex, ex, kind of presented to us, this thousand-year reign presented to us in chapter 20. How do we interpret it? And we said there's three views on this. The first is the post-millennial view, and that says that Christ returns after, post, the thousand years, millennium. The thousand years is not seen as literal, it's seen as figurative, and it's thought to be the time of a great harvest. So they see the thousand years as a time of phenomenal spiritual renewal and harvest on the face of the earth, the greatest spiritual awakening in the history of mankind that is so awesome, at the end of that, the world is now ready to receive Jesus, so he comes back. So he came back after this idyllic state, after this millennium after this thousand-year thousand year period on earth that's figurative, okay? That's post-millennial view. The second view is called the amillennial, and ah means without millennium, okay? They prefer to call it realized millennium, and they say that the thousand years is symbolic of the church age because it's a, it's, a, it's a wonderful age because it's the age of grace. And as a result, the church age that we're living in is this millennial period, and it's just figurative, just as the post-millennials take it, and Satan is currently bound, as it says in the first three verses of chapter 20, and the tribulation is still to come after which Jesus will judge the living and the dead. Then there will be a new heaven and a new earth, and that's how they take it. The problem with the amillennial point of view that's pretty obvious is that if Satan's bound, I would hate to see what the things would be like if he wasn't. He obviously, is, as the Bible says, is prowling around like a roaring lion. Now, they have explanations for that and, how, and why they still believe that uh, this view can be tenable with those verses there, and they pretty much spiritualize those verses as well and see these as metaphors of the conflicts until Jesus comes back. Again, these are wonderful Christian men and women. They're not bad guys at all. They're awesome. They love the Word. They just have an honest difference of opinion. Third view is called the premillennial. And that means Jesus comes at the end of the seven-year tribulation, which marks the beginning. So the end of the tribulation marks the beginning of the millennial period. Thus, it's called premillennial. 
Jesus established his kingdom on earth for a thousand years. Believers rule and reign with him during that period. And we asked our question, ourselves the last time this simple question, which of these three views is most likely? And so what we did is we said, okay, this is referring to the messianic promise. So let's look at all the promises made about this messianic time period where this messianic king in, in fulfillment of God's promise to King David was going to be on earth ruling. What would a world look like? And when you, as soon as you see that, you realize that this is going to be a, jo- a God-sized job, and we concluded this, and I'll quote exactly. When you look at those passages, put them together, we think the most likely position is the premillennial view based on the descriptions and characteristics of the messianic golden age seen in other parts of Scripture. In other words, they aren't spiritualized in those other places, and so you have, to inf- you have to force a spiritual interpretation rather than just take it literally. And it seems that these are literal promises being made, and that seems most likely to me. Understand, wonderful people disagree. We still love them, and it doesn't really mean anything in the end because God's will shall be done, and we'll find out who's right, and then we'll all high-five each other. Now, in chapter 11, excuse me, in chapter 20, we have a number of details that he talks about. Number one, that Satan is bound in verses 1 to 3. Number two, the believers will reign with Christ for a 1,000 years on earth, verses 4 to 6. Number three, that Satan is loosed at the end of that thousand years, leads a final rebellion, is crushed and thrown into the lake of fire. In other words, his eternal doom, he'll never come out again. And that's verses 7 to 10. Then in verses 11 to 15, we have the final judgment. And that's also known as the great white throne. And that's the passage that we're looking at today, the great white throne judgment in Revelation 20, verses 11 to 15. Let me read the passage. I'm going to pray and then make some explanatory comments that will help us understand it. This is what God's Word says. Then I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. The sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one, according to his works. Then, verse 14, then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, as we open your word today, I pray that your Holy Spirit would help me to clearly communicate what it means and that you would use it to nourish and encourage the souls of your people. I also pray, Father, that you would be honored and glorified through our study together and that each of us would be motivated and inspired by the wonderful things that you have in store for us, even though there are difficult days ahead. I pray, Lord, that if I say anything amiss, you would forgive me and that your people would just forget it as well and that you would cause the truth to stay in their heart and only that which is according to your truth. For I pray it in Jesus' name, amen. All right, so what we have here is this great white throne judgment. And as soon as you say that, you say, when does it happen? Where does it happen? How does it happen? What's involved? And so we have to get a context for understanding it. And so in order to do that, I've printed out an article, and I've edited it pretty heavily. And the article is called, Where Did Old Testament Believers Go When They Died? In other words, it's talking about what happens when people die, and how does this relate to the judgment we're looking at here in Revelation chapter 20? And so this is what the author says. The Old Testament believers went to a place of comfort and rest called paradise when they died. The Old Testament taught life after death, and that everyone who departed from this life went to a place of conscious existence. So everybody is still conscious after they die, both good and bad. The general term for this place was called Sheol, Hebrew word, which could be translated the grave, or better, the realm of the dead. So you die and go to the realm of the dead. That's the idea. The wicked go there in Psalm 9, 31 and 49, and Isaiah 5. And so are the righteous. They also go there. Genesis 37, Job 14, Psalm 6, Psalm 16, Psalm 88, Isaiah 38. Then he says this, and it's very important to see because there's lots of confusion about these issues. The New Testament equivalent of Sheol is Hades. So 
Sheol is the place that dead people go. That place has two parts, a good side and a bad side, okay? Paradise and pain, think of it that way. Well, in New Testament times, the New Testament word for the same place is called Hades. And likewise, it's divided into two pieces. And one place is called paradise, and the other place, again, is a problem, okay? And the name for that problem place is Gehenna, many times translated hell. So you go to the place of the dead, which is Hades, and then if you're a believer, you go to the paradise side of it, and if you're an unbeliever, you go to the hell side of it, or the painful part of it. And we learned this from a passage that Jesus talks to us about this in Luke 16. So let me read that passage, uh, chapter 16, verses 19 to 31. It says this, There was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. But there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, full of sores, who was laid at his gate, desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. However, the dogs came and licked his sores. So it was that the beggar died, and he was carried away by the angels to Abraham's side, also bosom. The rich man also died and was buried, verse 23. And being in torments in Hades, so he went to the bad side, Gehenna side, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus by his side, verse 24. Then he cried out and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger of wa- in water and cool my tongue for I am tormented in these flames. So whatever it is, it's painful and feels like fire. Where the worm dieth not and the flame is not quenched. Jesus said in other passages. This is Jesus telling the story. Verse 25, Abraham said, son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted and you are tormented. And besides all this, between us and you, there's a great gulf fixed so that those who want to pass from here to you cannot, nor can those from here pass, from there pass back to us. Verse 27, then he said, I beg you, therefore, Father Abraham, that you would send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, that they may testify to them, that he may testify to them, lest they also come to this place of torment. Verse 29, and Abraham said to him, they have Moses and the prophets. What does that mean? They have the word of God. They have the word of God. Let them hear them. And he said, no, Father Abraham, but if one goes to them from the dead, they will repent. But Abraham said to him, if they do not hear Moses and the prophet, in other words, if they will not listen to the word of God, neither will they be persuaded, though one rise from the dead. So what is Abraham saying? He's saying the word of God is sufficient to bring people the knowledge of God and the gift of of eternal life through faith. And if they're not willing to accept that, you can pile miracle upon miracle, even the resurrection of a man from the dead. (gasps) Would that be Jesus? And that won't convince them either. They need to have their heart open to the truth, and there's nothing that you can do to superimpose your will upon them. That's his point. So the writer of this article says, Lazarus' place of comfort is elsewhere called paradise. So the New Testament place of torment is called Gehenna in the Greek, Mark 9. Between paradise and Gehenna, hell, the two districts of Hades, Old Testament, the two districts of Sheol, there's a great chasm, according to this passage. The fact that no one could cross this chasm indicates that after death, one's fate is sealed. After death, one's fate is sealed. You don't get a second chance. There's no purgatory, no in-between. So today, when an unbeliever dies... He follows the Old Testament unbelievers to the torment side of Hades or Sheol, Gehenna, hell. At the final judgment, Hades will be emptied before the great white throne where its occupants will be judged prior to sentencing. On the other hand, when a believer dies today, he is present with the Lord in heaven. 2 Corinthians 5 puts it this way. So we are always confident, knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. So I'm here in my body, my soul, spirit's in my body. I'm not in the very presence of the Lord in heaven. 
For we walk by faith, not by sight. But we believe we'll be there one day. Verse 8, we are confident, yes, well pleased rather to be absent from the body. In other words, it'd be good if I, my soul spirit was separated from my body and be present with the Lord. In other words, dying isn't a bad thing. Well, actually, it's a step up. Therefore, we make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be well-pleasing to the Lord. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. So every believer is going to be judged based on works. But where is the judgment going to take place? In heaven, which means you made it. You made it to heaven you're going to be judged on your works to determine your level of reward. 1 Corinthians 3 says this, chapter, uh, chapter 3, verses 12 to 15. If anyone builds on this foundation, that is the cause of Jesus Christ, using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, straw, their work will be shown for what it is. In other words, we'll know the quality of the work you've done for the kingdom of God while you're in your physical body. Because the day will bring it to light, the day of judgment. It will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each person's work. And so the metaphor he's given us is you're going to go up there, you're going to lay out all your works there, and God's going to give the flame to it. Now, if it's pure, you're going to have it be purified. In other words, if it's, if it's got quality to it, the quality will be purified, and the, you know, the chaff will be burned away. So he says in verse 14, if what has been built survives, the builder will receive a reward. So he put the fire to it. The good stuff remains, gets purified. That's your reward. Verse 15, if it's burned up, the builder will suffer, suffer loss. In other words, you kind of wasted your life. But yet, we'll be saved. You're not kicked out of heaven. You're still saved. Praise the Lord. <laughs> You're on the golden streets. You got the golden ticket. You're good. Even though only as one escaping through the faint. In other words, you're saved by grace through faith and judged for your rewards based on works. Apparently, when a believer dies and goes into the presence of the Lord, he is immediately judged to receive his eternal rewards. That's what it seems to be, okay? Therefore, when a believer dies today, his spirit joins the spirits of Old Testament believers who are in the presence of the Lord today. Remember that the story in Luke 16 happened before the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so many believe that when he ascended into Hades and took the keys from death in Hades, he released all the believers on the uh, paradise side and brought their souls into heaven with him at his ascension. That's the belief, so that their spirits, Old Testament believer spirits, are all in heaven right now, waiting to be adjudicated for the reward and their bodies restored to them, which they don't have yet. And as we see later in the book of Revelation, or we saw earlier, there's a bunch of, bi there's a bunch of people in, in, in white robes because they haven't got their bodies yet. And so those tend to be the Old Testament saints and the, resurrect the unresurrected tribulation believers, okay, who died or martyred. Anyways, we continue. Therefore, when a believer dies, his spirit joins the spirits of the Old Testament believers who have been enjoying heaven for thousands of years. So a resurrection awaits everyone, either a resurrection to eternal life, this is known in the Bible as the first kind of resurrection, or a resurrection to shame and everlasting contempt, the second kind of resurrection. The Bible clearly states that the New Testament believers who have died will have their bodies resurrected at the return of Christ. In fact... 1 Thessalonians 4 puts it this way, but I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as those who have no hope. So their body is dead, so it looks like they're sleeping, right? For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, God will bring with him, Jesus, those who sleep in Jesus. In other words, whose bodies are dead. When Jesus comes back, he's going to do something with those, those dead bodies. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain on earth until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. In other words, we're alive. Let's say Jesus came back today. We're still alive. Well, we're going to wait for our resurrected, we're basically glorified body because we're already still living, right? So our bodies will be glorified. But before that happens, these guys that have died before us who are believers, they're going to be resurrected bodies. They're going to be glorified and united with God. And then we'll be glorified and united with Christ, okay? Verse 16, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ, 
So the dead bodies of believers will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain, guys walking around in regular bodies, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So we get transformed and go up and now get our eternal bodies. This is the best plan of all because you don't have to die. But there's a very small portion of Christians throughout history that will be at that lucky day or blessed day, I should say. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. And so the article ends with these, the following statement. The Bible is less clear about when the Old Testament saints will be resurrected. <laughs> that is absolutely true, and I appreciate when guys tell the truth about the data that's actually out there. It is our view that the Old Testament believers will be joined to their resurrected bodies at the end of the tribulation period, which means what? After Jesus comes back and the Battle of Armageddon wins it, throws Satan and everybody in, you know, in, in prison and all that, and is ready to establish his kingdom. So who's going to go in the kingdom? Those guys, right? And establishes reign on earth for a 1,000 years in Jerusalem. That sets it up. Now, based on that, based on that, this seems to be the order of events in end times concerning resurrection and judgment. I'm going to hit those quickly as we go through this phase. You ready? The order of the end times resurrection and ju judgment seems like this. Number one, the rapture. If we're going to take a pre-tribulational -tri rapture, this is where we take it. It doesn't matter where the rapture occurs, pre, mid, or post, but we'll just call it rapture. When Jesus Christ returns in the air to resurrect deceased believers and bring up living believers to meet him in the sky. We just read that. Number two, the tribulation period of seven years on earth culminating in the battle of Armageddon is finished. Number three, the second coming of Jesus to earth to wage the battle of Armageddon. He defeats Antichrist along with the false prophet at Armageddon, casts them into the lake of eternal fighter. That is where you never come out. And Christ also binds Satan and casts him into the bottomless pit for a thousand years. That's Revelation 20, verse 3. Or number four, Christ then judges all the tribulation survivors and the survivors of the battle of Armageddon to determine who will go into his earthly messianic kingdom or thousand-year reign. So those people who are on the earth at that time after the battle of Armageddon is all over, they, they survived all that and all the judgments and everything else, then they're going to face the judge. And Jesus is going to decide who's coming to the kingdom and who's not, okay? Number five, next, God resurrects the bodies of Old Testament believers and the bodies of tribulation believers, guys who died during the tribulation, they receive their glorified bodies and enter into the millennial kingdom in physical bodies. Why? Because the millennium is the messianic kingdom, and therefore, this is the belief of scholars, God resurrects all Old Testament believers' bodies at that time because they get the fulfillment of the promises of actually walking the streets of the Messiah's kingdom. That's the great blessing they were waiting for. So their spirits are up in heaven after the resurrection of Christ, but their bodies aren't resurrected until just opening day in Jerusalem for the new earthly messianic kingdom of their Messiah, Jesus Christ. Is that not awesome? It's a beautiful fulfillment of the promises. And so many conservative scholars believe that's the best way to look at it. Then uh, the second company he defeats Antichrist. I don't know which one. Yeah, here it is, number five. They receive their glorified bodies, the intermillennial kingdom in their physical bodies, which is the messianic kingdom. Number six, the thousand-year millennial reign, messianic reign of Christ on earth. Number seven, after those thousand years, Satan is released. We saw that in chapter 20 last time. He seeks out rebels. He finds them. They rebel against Christ and his kingdom. Christ crushes them and he takes Satan and casts him into the eternal lake of fire. That is the final doom of Satan. He never will be coming out again. That's it for him. Number eight, the body of all, uh, bodies of all unbelievers from all of human history are resurrected for the final judgment, also known as the great white throne. Number nine, at the great white throne judgment of unbelievers, each person receives their sentence and then is cast into the lake of fire. Number 10, the creation of the new heavens and the new earth for all eternity happens in chapters 21 and 22. So it seems that believers are resurrected in two stages. Stage one at the rapture or second coming 
and stage two after the tribulation and before the millennium, the messianic kingdom. That's the first kind of resurrection. It's going to happen in one of those two phases. While unbelievers experience only one resurrection, and that happens after the millennium, after the messianic kingdom, and it is a final judgment, and that's where we pick up today. And Revelation chapter 20, verses 11 to 15, is that great white throne judgment. John MacArthur, as a pastor in his commentary, says this, this passage describes the final sentencing of the lost and is the most serious, sobering, and tragic passage in the entire Bible. And boy, is that ever true. So here's some basic overview facts. Number one, it's for unbelievers only. Believers get the judgment seat of Christ, and they get judged and get rewards, and everything they blew, they just blew, but they're still going to be in heaven. Unbelievers, however, we're going to be judged here, and there is no winning option here. It's just how bad's it going to be. Number two, it's like a courtroom with very few notable differences. Number one, there will be no debate about the guilt or innocence of the person standing for judgment. Two, there will be no prosecutor or defense counsel. Three, there will be a judge but no jury. Four, there will be sentencing without an appeal. And number five, there will be punishment without parole. This is just bad news getting bad news, getting to be worse bad news. It's awful. So with that understanding, let's look at the particulars in verses 11 to 15. The first, we see the judge and the throne. He says, when I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. In other words, they tried to hide and get away. You're you're not getting away. You're all going to be wrapped in. You're going to be pulled in. You're going to stand there on judgment day if you're an unbeliever. There's no way out. Well, who is him who sat on it? Him who sat on it is Jesus Christ. What? Yeah, that's Jesus Christ doing the judgment. John 5 Jesus says this, for as the Father raises the dead and gives life to them, even so the Son gives life to whom he will. For the Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the Son, that all should honor the Son, just as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. So most assuredly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, condemnation, but shall be passed from death into life. Most assuredly, I say to you, the hour is coming, and now is, when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live. In other words, they're hearing me, and they're believing my message, and because of that, they embrace that message, and they receive the gift of eternal life. They're they're spiritually dead, but they're going to become spiritually alive in that moment. And then verse 26, for as the father has life in himself, so he has granted the son to have life in himself and has given him authority to execute judgment also because he is the son of man. In other words, he is the fulfillment of the prophecy that we saw in Daniel chapter 7 when one like the son of man comes up and meets the uh, ancient of days and is sitting on the throne with the ancient of days. He's going to take his place by the Father, and he's going to be the final judge in the end of days. Verse 12 then, and I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. Well, what are the books were opened? What books are we talking about? Well, the Bible mentions a number of books, and apparently these books are going to be there on judgment day. The first book is the book of God's word. We call it the Bible. John chapter 12, verse 48 Jesus said, he who rejects me and does not receive my words. So you reject the words of God, you're rejecting Jesus Christ, okay? He who rejects me and does not uh, receive my words has that which judges him. What, what, what? Yeah. You already have what's going to judge you. What is it? The word that I've spoken will judge him in that last day. He's going to say, you knew theirs? You knew this verse? You knew this biblical truth. You knew that biblical truth. You knew the back. You ignored it. You were without excuse. There is no plea that you can make. 
It's all the times you've heard the gospel, all the times you've come across the scriptures, all the times you just said, nah, 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 I don't believe it. It's just a bunch of stupid, old, dusty old book doesn't apply to me. Well, it's, it's gonna be, you're going to regret that day. Verse 24 in John 14, he who does not love me does not keep my words. And the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. So you reject the word of God, the Bible. You're rejecting Jesus. You're rejecting God the Father. You'll be held accountable on the day of judgment. Then there's the book of records. Psalm 139, 16. You saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. So God, every day you go through your life, God's just writing down the stuff you did that day. He has a full record of everything that took place. That book is going to be there on Judgment Day if you're an unbeliever. Then there's the book of tears and sorrows. This is actually beautiful. Psalm 56, 8. You keep track of all my sorrows. You have collected all my tears in your bottle. You have recorded each one in your book. So God has a book of tears and sorrows that, he, that will probably be there as well because God's going to give balanced judgment, and he's going to take into account all things. And there's the mercy and compassion of God even in the final judgment. And then there is the book of remembrance. The book of remembrance, Malachi 3.16. Then those who feared the Lord, who spoke with each other, and the Lord listened to what they said. Can you see this? You're in your small group. You're talking about God. You're having a nice meal together. God's being honored and praised and glorified. What's he doing? He's listening in. He's actually from heaven listening in. And it says, then those who feared the Lord spoke with each other, and the Lord listened to what they had said. In his presence, a scroll of remembrance was written to record the names of those who feared him and always thought about the honor of his name. Is that not awesome? God has a record of all the good things you say about him. He likes it when you brag about him behind his back. He takes note of that. And so that's going to be part of your judgment as well as a believer. That'll be part of your rewards because you speak well of God, you honor his name. Then there's the book of works, Revelation chapter 20, verse 12. It says, and the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. And so apparently God collects from all the other books, a singular book that has the works that he's going to address for this judgment. Verse 13, the sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one according to his works. Remember, we're always judged according to our works. We're forgiven according to our faith. Judged each one according to the works means this. Each person's life is evaluated based on their behavior. Believers are evaluated to determine the degree of rewards that they're going to receive. Unbelievers are evaluated to determine the degree of their eternal punishment. The location of your eternal destiny is determined by your response to the gospel and is recorded in this other book known as the book of life. And so you are going to heaven not based on your works. Your rewards are determined by your works. Your punishment is determined by your works. Your destiny is determined by your faith. If by God's grace, through faith in Jesus Christ, you entrust your soul to him, you get the gift of eternal life. And now you're in heaven, and your rewards will be based on how you behaved as a Christian. In Luke chapter 12, Jesus gives us the explanation of how this applies in the unbeliever, how their works are judged, and what is the outcome of that. In Luke chapter 12, verses 47 and 48, he gave the metaphor of a master judging his servants. He says this, That servant who knew his master's will but did not get ready or do what his master asked will receive a severe beating. But the one who did not know his master's will and did things worthy of punishment will receive a light beating. Still a beating, though. From everyone who has been given much, much will be required. And from the one who has been entrusted with much, even more will be asked. In other words, more will be demanded. So on judgment day, God will take into account how much you knew. And based on that, the severity of your punishment will be determined. The guy that knew it all, heard it his whole life, grew up in a Christian home, said, screw God, I'm going to do my own thing, and just kept going his own way and never repents and never embraces the gospel, that guy's going to have it really bad. 
the guy that never heard anything, kind of grew up in the woods and just kind of, I wonder if there's a God out there and that kind of thing. And a few people told him, yeah, there is. His name's Jesus. I don't know about that. And he doesn't really do much. Well, it's going to be a less of a beating. It's still a beating, though. You don't want a beating because the beating is in a place that's awful, as we're going to see in a minute. John, so how do you get out of that? John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world would be saved through him. God's trying to save you. He doesn't want you to go to the beating. He wants you to be in heaven. He doesn't want to condemn you. He wants to show you the gift of eternal life. If you harden your heart, stiffen your neck, you're going you're to be doomed. That's the whole point. God loves you. He wants you to repent. Please, please repent. Just admit it. You're wrong. How hard is that? Everyone you know will tell you, yeah, you're an idiot. You do all kinds of stupid stuff. Everyone does. You're not perfect. Humble yourself and admit, I need a Savior. I'm an imperfect person. Thank God he saves someone to save me. That's the gospel, and I hope you'll repent. Ephesians chapter 2 says how? For by grace, in other words, God's gift of kindness, you've been saved through faith, through trusting him. And that not of yourself is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. In other words, when you put your faith in Christ, you're trusting him to take care of you. You're not saying I'm a really good guy shaped up. I'm actually pretty good. I really don't need you, but you know what, just in case. No, it, you need help. I need help. We're all sinners. We need a Savior. Jesus is the Savior. If you believe he's the Savior, then act on that belief. Ask him to save you. That's what you have to do. If you don't, you will be severely judged because you will have now heard the truth from me, and you either respond or you don't. About a month ago or so, I was walking down Main Street, walking my dog. It was the afternoon. I think it was a Friday night, about 10 o'clock at night, and these three guys were kind of following me, and they had a video camera. And they came up to me, and they were kind of like punk kids, I would say about 25, and a little smart alecky and all that. And I got my dog and whatever, I'm having fun. And the guy comes up to me and he says, hey, what are you doing here? And I said, what am I doing here? I'm a servant of the Lord. How can I help you? And I goes, what do you mean you're a servant of the Lord? I said, I'm a servant of the Lord. I'm here to tell you how you can go to heaven. That's what I'm doing here today. And I go, oh, I don't need a Savior. I, already, I know how to go to heaven. And I said, well, I don't think you do. Why don't you tell me how you plan to get to heaven? Well, I'm not perfect, but I do lots of good things. And he starts going off on this kind of stuff or something along those lines. I don't remember all the details. And I said, no, you're going to hell for sure. If that's your answer, for sure you're going to hell. Now, they're filming me while this is going on, and his friend's kind of giving him like, ha, ha, you're getting burned, you know, because this, this old man's talking to you, and you don't know what to say. And he said, well, you know, I think that there's sort of, and he starts telling me his worldview of how God's going to, you know, run the world. And he kind of gets done with that, and the light's getting ready to change. And I said, listen, 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 listen. The gift of God today is me. I am here to tell you how you can have eternal life. If you will acknowledge that you are a sinner and you will cry out to Jesus and say, Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner. Would you please save me and forgive my sins? Come into my life and make me a child and a member of your family. He will do that. And he goes, oh, yeah, you think you know everything. I said, no, I don't know everything, but I know enough of this. I'm a sinner and I need a Savior. Jesus saved me. He can save you too. Something along those lines. And so he's following me down the steps as we're going towards the amphitheater, and you know, he's kind of getting a little more upset. His friends are kind of giving him a hard time, and this is all getting on this little video deal. And then I, I just thought about it in a minute, and he's, he's kind of like saying, ah, oh, you just don't know what you're talking about, rah, rah, rah. You know, I, I'm fine. I'm not worried about it. And I just, it's like the Spirit of God hit me at that moment. I turned around, I pointed at his face just like this, and I said, well, on Judgment Day, you will be held without excuse for you have heard the truth of eternal life and rejected it. And I turned around and left. I hope it shook him to his core because that's the truth. Jesus Christ is the only way to God. I'm not trying to be right. I'm just trying to get to heaven and take as many people with me as I possibly can. That's my goal. And that's God's goal as well. And that's why he promises in, Rebel, in Romans chapter 8, verse 1, there, therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Never be judged. You're just going to be rewarded. Let's get back. we got two more verses. Verse 14. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. That means all the contents. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. 
You have to have your name written in. Someone has to write your name in. You have to get your name written into the book of life so that you will not be cast into the lake of fire of eternal doom. So what is the book of life? Well, the book of life is the record of the people who have put their faith and trust in the Savior and as a result have received eternal life. Let me read to you what Billy Graham says in his book on this issue. He writes this. So he answers this question, what is the book of life? Quote, the book of life is God's record of all those over the centuries who have trusted Christ as their Savior and have followed him as Lord. Many books are mentioned in the Bible. The book of the covenant, the book of the law, the book of the kings, the book of the records, the book of the remembrance, the book of the Lord, and so forth. But one book is supremely important, the book of life. The Bible says that God's, in God's presence, quote, books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life, and only those whose names were written in the Lamb's book of life will enter heaven. If you have given your life to Jesus Christ, your name is already written there. Furthermore, Jesus has promised that if you belong to him, nothing will ever be able to remove your name from its pages. He declared, I will never blot out his name from the book of life, but will acknowledge his name before my father and his angels, Revelation chapter 3, verse 5. This promise should be written on the heart of every believer. What about those who have not turned to Christ in repentance and faith, who have rejected him as their Savior and Lord? Tragically, their names will not be found there, and they will enter eternity with no hope of heaven. The Bible solemnly warns, quote, if anyone's name is not found written in the book of life, he has, was thrown into the lake of fire. Revelation 20, verse 15. For anyone reading this who has not given his or her life to Christ, it is not too late. Now is the time to acknowledge your sin before God and accept his merciful love for you. Don't turn away. Pray to him for forgiveness. By faith, receive Jesus Christ into your life. Then you will have the assurance that your name has been written in the book of life, which God himself will open and read someday. Nothing will bring us greater joy than hearing the Savior call out our names on the roll in the book of life, end quote. Is that not awesome? And that's how I want to end this message. If you have not clearly understood that you are a sinner to the point you actually confess to God that you're a sinner and that you need a Savior and that you believe Jesus Christ is the only Savior and that you believe that to the point you ask him to come into your life, take away your sin, forgive it, reconcile your relationship with God, fill you with his spirit and cause you to be born again, and give you the gift of eternal life he promised. If you will do that, you will be in heaven. If you do not do that, you will not be in heaven. You will not be in the book of life. You get in by God's grace, which means he didn't have to do this. He could have just condemned us all because we're sinners. But because he loves us, he showed us grace and gave us a game plan. And the game plan is he said a Savior. And if you ask the Savior to save you from your sins and reconcile your relationship to God, he'll do that. Because he said, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. So call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that you might be saved. Don't put it off. You have no guarantee that you're going to make it. You have no idea what could happen to you today. And I'm not just saying that to scare you. When I gave this original sermon, I only got a third of the way through. I had no idea I was going to puke in my mouth, have to leave the stage, go home, puke my guts out for two days. I I would have bet anything that wasn't going to happen. But it did happen because I don't know the future, and you don't either. Get your life squared away with God today. Do it and do it today. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray for everyone who's with us and hearing this message right now that your Holy Spirit would fall upon them. And if they know Christ as Savior, that he would bring them great comfort, assurance, and joy in their heart, and that they would join me in this very moment praying for those around them, that their hearts would be open if they don't know Christ, and that they would understand, I'm a sinner, I can't fix it, nothing that I can do can repair it, but God loves me, and he sent a Savior so that I wouldn't be condemned. His name is Jesus, and so, Jesus, I believe that you will save me and reconcile my relationship with the Father and give me the gift of eternal life if I just call upon you and ask you to do it. 
because you promised in your word you would. And so right now, that's what I'm doing. I'm calling on you to come into my life, take away my sin, cause me to be born again, reconcile my relationship with the Father, and enable me to live for you and with you forever and ever and ever. I accept you today as my Lord and my God and my King. And I look forward to being with you in your heavenly kingdom. Thank you. Amen.